Hello, my name is Yuli Senikov, and this is my pre-recorded lecture for the 2020 Princeton Initiative. The title of the lecture is Economies with Financial Frictions. So this lecture is about methods to solve economic models with financial frictions. But this lecture also has some other uh, key ideas that are applicable more broadly. And uh, the key idea is uh, uh, past, present, and future. So in an economic model, we want to have the past. And from the past, we have forward equations, which can determine quantities such as investments and uh, financial positions and uh, wealth. Uh, and uh, we need those forward equations in order to understand the situation at which we arrive to today. Um, now, today, people will make today's decisions and markets will function and markets will clear. And those decisions, they will be made by people who are looking into the future, anticipating what can happen into the future. So from the future to today, we have uh, backward equations, uh, which summarize the future through um, objects such as uh, value functions and prices and we need to know those in order to give people sufficient information to make uh, today's decisions so this idea is uh, very general and i want to allow myself to get a little bit distracted in this lecture in order to illustrate this idea more broadly and in order to do that I'm going to start with two off-topic examples just to encourage you to think outside the box. I would like to start with two off-topic examples about how the past and the future, uh, how the forward equations and the backward equations come together in a single economic model. The first example is a classic Bewley economy. So imagine that you have individuals who have a stochastic income with uh, two income levels, high income and low income, and there is a Poisson switching process between the two income levels. So these individuals will, may be concerned that sometimes their income is low, and when the income is high, they may want to save against uh, the hard times. Okay, so then the individual problem is given by a budget constraint. So the individual is uh, choosing uh, how much to save and the savings level, the savings uh, grow at some interest rate R uh, and uh, the income is added to savings and uh, people consume out of savings. So this is the budget constraint of individuals. So subject to the budget constraint, the individuals, they maximize their utility uh, and this problem of maximizing utility is uh, uh, solved through um, dynamic programming. We have uh, individual value functions and the value functions, they satisfy some backward equations. So the individuals uh, look into the future and from the future, they solve backwards to back out what is their expected utility and what is uh, optimal way for them to act. So this is individual problem. Now, when we put these individuals together in a market, then um, we have a, a market clearing condition for uh, total consumption has to equal to uh, total income of all individuals. So if we integrate total consumption with respect to the distribution over savings level and over income levels, um, that has to equal to the uh, total income. And uh, the distribution over uh, uh, savings level and uh, income level has to satisfy some forward equation, which is guided by the individual decisions. So we'll have some type of a Kolmogoro forward equation that uh, uh, gives us the distribution over uh, savings level and uh, income levels and of course, the individual demand for uh, consumption is going to be a function of uh, savings and income. So this is one example in which uh, 
backward equations and uh, forward equations, they come together in an interesting way in a classic model. So my second off-topic example is the classic SIR model. So it's in the spirit of the times and probably uh, most of you have seen this model by now. So it's a model of epidemiology um, and uh, this is a model um, in which uh, everything goes forward. So this is typical in sciences to think about uh, uh, initial conditions and uh, these initial conditions, they define everything going forward. Uh, for example, if we have uh, initial uh, velocities of uh, objects and how these objects interact, we can solve this whole system forward to see how it evolves. So this model is moving forward and there are three uh, quantities. There is uh, a number of people who are susceptible to the disease then there's a number of people who are infected and then there's a number of people who are uh, recovered uh, and uh, there is a contact between susceptible people and infected people uh, and uh, the number of contacts is proportional to the product of the number of infected and susceptible times some uh, uh, contact rate uh, beta and uh, depending on the number of contacts the some susceptible people become infected and uh, this is the rate at which susceptible people move into the infected group becoming infected and then the infected group uh, they recover at rate gamma uh, and uh, so they move from the infected group to the recovery group uh, and this is the uh, classic uh, SIR epidemiological model so now if an economist uh, looks at this model, what's the first thought? Well, the first thought, of course, is that economists are used to thinking about uh, people's expectations. Uh, and the first thought, of course, is to uh, introduce uh, those expectations and uh, to have behavior that uh, takes those expectations into account. Uh, so an economist could, for example, uh, think that the contact rate may not be exogenously given, but it's rather an endogenous choice. So, for example, people who are susceptible, they choose their contact rate with others somewhere in the interval, let's say, from zero to beta. Um, and they would ideally like um, contact rate beta but uh, it's costly for them to reduce contact. They can reduce contact rate at a cost, and this cost is given by a function C of beta prime. Uh, at the bliss point, beta C of beta equals zero, and uh, the more individuals reduce the contact rate, the costier it is, and this cost function is uh, convex. So reducing the contact rate with others is uh, costly, uh, but becoming infected is also costly, so there's a cost of becoming infected B. Okay, so this B doesn't have to be a selfish cost, it could potentially uh, take into account uh, the cost of you know infecting the loved ones. Um, and there is a discount rate uh, rho. So uh, with this modification, how would the model change? Well, the forward equations, they are almost the same as before, the only difference is that, of course, the contact rate, instead of being con constant, it is now uh, endogenously determined. Okay, uh, And uh, the contact rate is determined by the individual minimization problems where individuals, they choose, they look forward and they choose uh, their contact rate beta prime to minimize the expected uh, cost of uh, reducing the contact rate with others, which is costly and the cost of becoming infected. So time tau, potentially never, in, in which case tau is infinity, tau is a stopping time, they become infected and then they suffer the cost of B. Okay, so this is a model that has uh, uh, forward equations and uh, backward equations, and you could imagine that this type of a model could potentially have uh, very different implications from the standard SIR model. Let me describe the main model for today's lecture. 
This model is based on a paper that Marcus and I have published in AAR in 2014, a macroeconomic model with the financial sector. The main ingredient of this model is also an important ingredient for many other models, is uh, capital, which is uh, subject to stochastic Brownian shocks. So people can build new capital through investment and capital also depreciates at rate delta. People can trade capital among each other at price Q and this price in equilibrium is determined uh, endogenously. Uh, there are two types of agents, people in this economy, experts and households. Experts are more productive at managing capital than households and the difference is that experts get output per unit of capital of A minus Yota, Yota is the investment, and households uh, get A underlined minus Yota, where A underlined is less than A. Uh, so typically experts, because they're more productive, they would want to hold more capital relative to their wealth. And they would want to get financing from households either through debt or through equity. They could issue unlimited amounts of debt. There is no constraint on debt issuance in this model, but there is a financial friction uh, on the amount of equity they can issue. The financial friction is that experts or households for that matter, they can issue equity, but they must keep at least a fraction chi underlined of uh, risk. So the amount of risk that they keep, uh, chi t, could be a function of time, has to be bigger or equal than chi underlined. Because experts are more productive than households and uh, they have a, a greater return from holding capital than households, typically they would become wealthier and wealthier relative to households um, unless there is a counterbalancing force. And the counterbalancing force here is that we assume that experts are uh, less patient than households, so they will be consuming at a higher rate. So the experts, they will typically earn at a higher rate, but they will also consume at a higher rate. And uh, this is going to lead to um, an undegenerate stationary distribution in this model. Uh, so how is this model related to the uh, principles of this lecture? So in this model, there will be forward equations for the law of motion of the expert's wealth share. In this model, there will be backward equations for the value functions of experts and households. And we need the forward equations to know how we arrive at today's situation. And we need the backward equations in order to figure out what decisions people are going to make at the given moment of time, taking into account their expectations of the future. And today's decisions, they will be the allocation of, of capital and the allocation of a consumption, how much capital people choose to hold uh, and uh, how they choose to finance this capital and how much they choose to consume. Besides people's decisions, in addition, we also have uh, in this model endogenous risk, which is very, very interesting. So endogenous risk arises in this model because of financial frictions, because uh, uh, wealth distribution affects how constrained experts are. And this feeds into the price of capital. When the price of capital fluctuates, anybody who holds capital is exposed to the price of capital and this is the source of endogenous risk. So this is very, very interesting. In our main model, people will make consumption and portfolio decisions. Experts will choose how much capital to hold and how to finance their capital holding by borrowing and by issuing equity. Because of that, we need to talk about asset pricing a little bit. The most basic fact about asset pricing that you'll need to use is that stochastic discount factor can price assets which are available for somebody to invest. The stochastic discount factor is uh, 
the discounted marginal utility of consumption uh, and it captures the marginal utility that a person gets from a unit of consumption in a given uh, state in the future. For any self-financing trading strategy available to the agent, self-financing means that you reinvest the money. For any strategy with value A, A times the stochastic discount factor has to be a martingale. Why that is the case? Well, if it's not a martingale, it means that the individual is not uh, optimizing. If this was not a martingale, but for example, went up in expectation, then the individual could benefit by consuming a little bit less today and putting more wealth in strategy A to get a little bit more value uh, at the future date and therefore get higher utility. So that's why this has to be a martingale. The fact that it's a martingale leads to uh, a useful equation, which is this equation right here. So if a stochastic discount factor and uh, the value of a trading strategy are diffusion processes, then you can find the drift of the product. The drift has to be zero for a martingale and the drift of the product equals the sum of the drifts of the individual processes plus the product of volatility. So the first point that I want to make on the slide is just emphasize this equation, which will be very useful. The second point I'd like to make is that we can do valuation of assets in different numerators. It will be useful for us sometimes in this uh, lecture to change numerator. So for example, we can change numerator by dividing a by y. So we ask the question, how many units of y we have uh, in the payup of the asset and we get uh, a prime. In that case, uh, we can value uh, wealth in another numerator by uh, an appropriately adjusted stochastic discount factor. So we have to change units to see how much marginal utility the individual gets for each unit of y by multiplying the stochastic discount factor by y to get the xi prime. Now, if a times xi was a martingale, it's a martingale if and only if a prime times uh, xi prime is a martingale because y cancels out. So uh, that's the second point. The third point that I want to make is that we can also value two assets relative to one another. So if we have an equation like this for asset A and also an equation like that for another asset B, then we can subtract one equation from another to cancel out the drift of the stochastic discount factor, which is sometimes difficult to compute. If you do that, then we get an equation like this. The difference in expected returns of assets A and B is explained by the difference in risk between uh, assets A and B times the volatility of the uh, stochastic discount factor, which gives us the price of risk. And uh, one remark I would like to make about this equation is that the difference in risk is independent of numerator, because when we change numerator, we subtract the volatility of y. And if you subtract the volatility of y, both from the volatility of A and the volatility of B, that is going to cancel out. So this is independent of numerator, but of course the uh, price of risk will depend on numerator and the expected return, of course, will depend on numerator. So next I would like to illustrate the usefulness of this asset pricing principle by taking a detour and taking a very classic problem and showing how to solve it using these equations. So here's a problem. So imagine uh, an investor with CRRA utility and some wealth who can put money in a risk-free asset with return RF and a risky asset with a risk premium pi and a risk sigma. So then the wealth of this investor uh, 
follows a law of motion like this. So given uh, portfolio weight X and the risky asset, the investor will earn a risk premium of uh, X times pi and will face the risk of X times sigma. And given consumption of uh, omega times wealth, we are going to have an extra term here uh, for the fact that the investor is uh, uh, taking some wealth to consume. Um, so given this uh, law of motion of wealth, we know that uh, consumption is uh, proportional to wealth, so consumption will follow exactly the same law of motion. We can uh, derive the uh, stochastic discount factor for this investor and use the stochastic discount factor to price the assets available to this investor. So the stochastic discount factor is discounted marginal utility of consumption. And when consumption follows this law of motion, the same as wealth, then we can derive using Ito's formula, the law of motion of Xi. And here, because of exponential discounting, we have a uh, minus rho. And then because of uh, power gamma and because of this drift, we have a uh, minus gamma times the drift. We have an extra term because of volatility. And uh, then we have the volatility term. So um, Xi uh, times uh, the risk-free rate has to be a martingale. And likewise, we can price the uh, risky asset using stochastic discount factor Xi. So we can write down two equations by applying this uh, pricing principle to the uh, risk-free and risky asset. And these two equations can allow us to derive optimal portfolio weight and the risky asset X and optimal consumption rate omega. And I'm not going to go through the calculation, but I'm going to leave it as an exercise. Now, let me come back to our main model and discuss how total capital is split between experts and households, how total risk is split between experts and households, and how wealth is split between experts and households. So in this slide, there is a circle which illustrates all of the capital in the economy, which is also the entire wealth in the economy, because in this economy, all other assets besides capital are in zero net supply, like the risk-free asset. So the value of all capital is Q times K. Uh, and because of this, the risk of capital per unit is uh, sigma plus sigma Q, because sigma is the risk of K and sigma Q is the endogenous risk of the price of capital Q. So how is this capital split between experts and households? Um, experts will hold some fraction psi of capital and households they will hold some fraction one minus psi. So because experts are more productive, they will typically try to hold more capital. And because of that, they will have a higher price of uh, risk. So imagine for a moment that uh, uh, experts indeed have a higher price of risk. In that case, uh, experts would want to um, finance their capital holding by issuing as much equity as possible to pass on the risk to households. And we have a constraint on how much uh, uh, risk experts can pass on to households. The, they have to hold at least uh, risk fraction chi. So they have to hold at least uh, fraction chi times psi of the risk of all capital. Uh, and uh, fraction one minus chi underlined times psi, the, this is the risk they pass on to households in the form of equity issuance. And then the households, they hold entirely the risk of the capital that they hold. And so uh, this uh, fraction is going to illustrate the risk held by experts and this fraction is going to illustrate the risk uh, held by households. Now, what about wealth? So experts 
their wealth share is denoted by eta. It's a ratio of the wealth of experts to the total wealth in the economy. And uh, if uh, eta is less than uh, chi underline times psi, then experts will be levered, which means that they hold a disproportionate amount of the total risk of the economy relative to uh, their wealth share. So in that case, when there is a positive uh, uh, shock to the value of capital, then the experts, they will become uh, richer relative to households. So here we have an illustration of how total capital is divided, how total risk is divided, and how total wealth is divided. Okay, so next let me discuss the law of motion of eta, which is the forward equation for our model. And on this slide, you see a lot of formulas, so it may look a little bit scary, but actually here it's not much more than the information that you have on the previous slide with the pi and the information that we have talked about when we discussed the asset pricing. So we'll use asset pricing in a special numerator and uh, the information that's given here. So now, uh, first let me discuss the division of risk. So the experts, they have wealth share eta and they hold fraction chi times psi of total risk. Therefore, their portfolio weight on capital is this ratio and given the risk of capital, the risk of their wealth is uh, sigma uh, n. The households, the risk of their wealth is uh, given by the same principle. Here the numerator is the fraction of capital risk that they hold, and this is the fraction of uh, their wealth as a fraction of total, which is also denoted by uh, eta uh, underline. So this is the uh, risk of experts wealth. And if you talk about the risk of the experts wealth share eta, then eta is the ratio of n, the wealth of experts to total wealth, q times k. And so by eta's formula, the risk of eta is sigma n minus sigma minus sigma q. Taking into account the formula for sigma n, we get this expression. Now we are ready to talk about not the volatility of eta, but the drift. And here we will use the asset pricing equation, but the trick is to get to the answer fast. We will use the special numerator of total wealth. So this is a little bit tricky because it's a, a tricky numerator. So we have to be careful how we do it. And uh, the nice thing is that in this numerator total wealth, the return on the whole portfolio that experts hold is given by mu eta plus the consumption rate of experts. Because mu eta is the rate of appreciation of the experts wealth in this numerator, this is the capital gains rate, and this is the dividend yield, that's the total expected return. The risk-free rate will have some some returns, so we are valuing the uh, total portfolio of experts relative to the risk-free rate. The difference between the risk of these two assets does not depend on numerator, and it's just equal to sigma n, because uh, in the numerator of output, this is the risk of the total portfolio of experts, and the risk of the risk-free rate is zero. So this is the difference in risk between the expert's portfolio and the risk-free rate. Uh, and the, uh, the volatility of the stochastic discount factor, uh, we have to take into account numerator, that's why we have uh, sigma hat here, and it's gonna be some uh, um, uh, variable. So we have this pricing equation in the numerator of total wealth for experts. We have an analogous equation for households this risk-free rate, we don't know what it is. It's actually not even the risk-free rate here because this is the expected return in the risk-free asset in the special numerator. Uh, but we can eliminate it by subtracting one equation from another. And if we do that, then we know that the drifts of uh, 
uh, eta and eta underlined are related by this equation because total pi stays the same. So when we do the subtraction, we can also represent mu uh, eta underlined in terms of mu eta, and we get an equation like this. And this equation gives us the drift of the expert's wealth share from the risk that the experts take and their price of risk, from the risk that the households take and their price of risk, and from the consumption rates of experts and households, and voila, here we have our forward equation. Now, I have just talked about forward equations for wealth shares. Now, in our model, we also have uh, static equations for the allocation and endogenous risk. And then we have uh, backward equations for the value function. Now, equations for the allocation, there are potentially many in this model and if you imagine more complicated models there are even more in this model households choose how much capital to hold experts they choose how much capital to hold and how to finance their capital holdings so there can be potentially many decisions and in addition people also choose how much to invest instead of deriving all of those allocation equations one by one I'm going to show you one principle how to get all of them from one single uh, maximization problem and this principle is based on Fisher separation theorem which says that given the cost of capital firms will make decisions to maximize value and assets will be allocated to most productive firms so what this principle says for our model is that given risk and given the price of risk, we have to solve this maximization problem allocating capital and choosing capital structure to maximize expected return minus the average cost of risk. Um, and. Uh, Marcus and I call this the price taking central planners problem because we take as given risk and the price of risk, even though the outcome of this problem, the allocation that this problem spits out will affect the endogenous risk of capital, how we'll see in a moment, and will therefore affect the price of risk. Now, if we expand this problem in terms of formulas, then here's what we have. So the expected return consists of uh, the dividend yield and the capital gains rate. And this is the dividend yield for all of the capital in the economy. And the dividend yield depends on how much capital is allocated to experts versus households, because experts and households, they have different output rates. Here we have uh, the capital gains rate, so we expand, can expand it. And here we have the um, price of risk, which depends on how risk is allocated between experts and uh, households, how much risk we have, and then the volatilities of uh, st uh, stochastic discount factors for the experts and households. If we actually look at this maximization problem and derive conditions for optimal choices of uh, Psi and Chi and also Iota for investment, then you get uh, these conditions. For, so for Psi, this is a linear expression. Um, and here right away I picked uh, Chi underlined, assuming that uh, uh, Sigma Xi is bigger than or equal than sigma xi um, underlined um, and uh, we have that this expression has to be non-negative and the psi is less than one then we would have an interior solution then this expression has to be zero this is for psi for chi we have that if uh, the experts have a higher price of risk than the households, then the experts uh, 
choose to retain the least amount of risk subject to the equity issuance constraint and pass on as much risk as they can to households. And then for the optimal choice of IOTA, we also get um, the return maximizing IOTA from this uh, equation. Uh, and this is going to be the condition that determines IOTA. So here we see that IOTA will be a function of Q and an increasing function of Q. So this is the allocation. Now, this problem takes risk as given, but the allocation that this problem determines will affect the risk exposure of experts and households and therefore will affect endogenous risk. So let's see how endogenous risk arises in this model. So sigma eta, the volatility of experts wealth share, depends on sigma and also depends on sigma q. And because sigma eta depends on sigma, uh, shock to capital is going to affect the expert's wealth share. And when the price of capital Q is a function of eta, it will also affect the price. This will lead to the volatility of the price sigma Q, which will affect the volatility of eta again. And we have a feedback loop here. Uh, so in order to determine the formation of endogenous risk, we have to use Ito's formula and uh, uh, express sigma q given from the volatility of eta and from the derivative of q with respect to eta. So we have this formula from Ito's formula. If we plug in this expression for sigma eta into this formula, we can then express out sigma q which is present on both sides and moving it all to one side we have an expression like this and here we see how endogenous risk sigma q is formed and uh, endogenous risk its presence depends on the leverage of experts if experts are not levered if this is zero then uh, endogenous risk would be zero and also depends on q depending positively on eta so the bigger is q prime of eta and the bigger is the leverage of experts the bigger sigma q is going to be according to this expression and uh, when in equilibrium do ex we expect the endogenous risk to be the greatest well it will be the greatest when q depends more significantly on eta and that will happen when changes in eta, they will affect the allocation of capital, which will affect the price of capital. Okay, so, so far we have discussed forward equations for the law of motion of wealth shares. We have discussed static equations that determine the allocation and uh, we have discussed a static equation that determines how endogenous risk is formed. We still need to talk about the future and the value functions and how to use value functions to determine the price of risk and to determine consumption rates. But um, what we have already is in fact sufficient to solve a model with the logarithmic utility because for logarithmic utility we don't need to do a whole lot of analysis uh, of the future because logarithmic utility has certain convenient myopic properties. So for logarithmic utility, if we think about the consumption and portfolio choice problem, we know that the solution has two convenient properties. One of them is that consumption is proportional to wealth. Consumption equals discount rate times wealth. And this is regardless of investment opportunities. And then the second principle that we have is that the price of risk is given by 
the volatility of wealth because uh, the um, marginal utility of logarithmic utility is 1 divided by c. So the volatility of marginal utility is minus the volatility of consumption c. Uh, and uh, consumption is proportional to wealth, so the volatility is also minus the volatility of wealth. And here we have the expression for the volatility of wealth from before. So um, let's do uh, some analysis of the model with logarithmic utility. So we have um, first from this principle consumption equals rho times wealth, we have a market clearing condition for consumption. On the left hand side of this condition, we have the supply of consumption goods which depends on the allocation of capital between uh, experts and households minus investment times the total amount of capital. On the right hand side, we have the demand for consumption, which has uh, a part which is the experts demand of, for consumption equal to the experts discount rate times their wealth. Then we have the household's discount rate times the household's wealth. And of course, in this condition, uh, capital cancels out. Our economy is scale invariant with respect to capital. Uh, and canceling out capital, we get this simpler equation. That's the market clearing condition for output. Then, if we since we have a an explicit expression for the price of risk, we can plug this expression into our condition, first order condition for psi. Uh, and if we plug this in, then we have uh, an equation like this. And then the last equation on the slide is uh, the equation that determines endogenous risk. So it turns out that we can use these three equations. So in fact, uh, this one will only hold in the region psi less than 1 to solve the uh, allocation and to solve for the price of capital and then yet we have yet another separate equation for the uh, drift of uh, wealth shares. So how can we use these three equations? It turns out that we can use these equations to get a first order ordinary differential equation for the price of capital Q of eta in the region where psi is less than 1. So we can solve for this whole region near eta equal to 0 in which uh, both experts and households hold capital. And then uh, we can use uh, this expression to by plugging in psi equal to 1 to solve the model in the region where uh, only experts hold capital. So the crisis region in which psi is less than 1 gives us as I said, a first order differential equation for Q of eta, the price of capital. And we can start solving this equation at eta equal to zero, at which point we have uh, psi equal to zero because when experts have zero wealth, they cannot hold any capital. And then Q of zero, well, if we plug in psi equal to zero into this equation, then we can solve it for uh, q at eta equal to zero, and this is going to give us q of zero. So we have our initial condition. From that initial condition, uh, the first order differential equation is that given eta and given q of eta, we want to determine q prime of eta. And how can we do it? Well, we have to go through each equation one by one, and uh, from the first equation, this is the first equation, uh, since Q is uh, known at a given uh, point eta, we can determine psi from this equation. So first we determine psi, then we use our second equation in which psi is known and Q is known and we can use it to determine sigma Q. And then this sigma Q, we can plug it into the third equation in order to determine uh, Q prime, and this gives us a first order differential equation for Q, uh, and this way we can uh, 
solve the, the for the crisis region and then uh, everything else is relatively straightforward so let me show you a computed solution so here is a computed solution and it has a crisis region in which um, uh, experts sell capital to households and because households hold some of the capital uh, the price of capital drops in this region and because the price of capital drops the price of capital is sensitive to the state variable of eta this leads to uh, the formation of uh, endogenous risk so endogenous risk will be high in crisis and this endogenous risk will lead to elevated volatility of eta in crisis and outside the crisis the volatility of eta is falling now the drift of eta is going to be uh, positive for low eta when uh, uh, the experts are particularly levered uh, and uh, when uh, uh, the risk premia are high uh, and uh, as eta gets larger and larger the risk premia come down and uh, the fact that experts are less patient than households and they consume at a greater rate uh, the, it will lead to a negative drift in ETA. So uh, there's positive drift here, there's negative drift here, and uh, in the absence of volatility, the system would be at this point, but because of the volatility, the system uh, goes uh, around this point and uh, occasionally enters the regions uh, in which uh, endogenous risk rises and the experts sell capital to households. So there is also an interesting region which I have not discussed, which is the region uh, above uh, uh, one half. So here there is the assumption that experts can issue uh, some equity to households, but must retain fraction of risk at least uh, one half. So if the experts wealth share is greater than one half, it turns out that this equity issuance constraint is not binding. Um, so then we get perfect risk sharing in this region. This is something that they have not discussed, but this region is not really so interesting because the system can never enter it. So uh, at the boundary of this region, the drift is negative and volatility is zero. And if the system ever starts there, it will just steadily drift down into the region where all of the action is, is happening. So I have not discussed this possibility. I kind of uh, skimmed over it, but um, as we see from this graph, that possibility is not uh, really something that uh, uh, plays a significant role in equilibrium. Now, let me come back to Sierra Ray utility with gamma not equal to one. And uh, let me do a little bit of a recap of everything that we have. So we have expression for the volatility of experts wealth share. We have an expression for the drift of the experts wealth share. We also have uh, expressions for uh, the volatilities of experts and households wealth, which enter right here. So these equations are about the past. They are forward equations for the law of motion of wealth share. We also have uh, static equations. We have uh, an equation for the, um, the first order condition for the allocation of capital. We have an equation for the formation of uh, endogenous risk. And uh, like in the case of logarithmic utility, we can write uh, the market clearing condition for uh, consumption. So of course, when we have theory utility, then uh, certain things in these equations uh, are not directly available to us unless we know the uh, value functions of households and experts. And specifically, what comes from the value functions of households and experts are the price of risk, in in this equation for the drift of eta because the drift of eta 
depends on uh, the return that experts and households get for the risk that they take, which depends on the price of risk. Also, the price of risk enters the allocation equation for capital. We also have, uh, from the value functions, the decisions uh, how much to consume versus how much to save. And uh, this decision, how much to consume versus how much to save, will enter the market clearing condition for uh, consumption goods and will also enter the law of motion of uh, experts and uh, households' uh, wealth shares. Now, in order to use value functions for CRRA utility, we have to understand certain facts about those value functions. So, in general, with uh, an investor with CRRA utility, the value function of an investor can be written in this form. Uh, and uh, a part of uh, this uh, form is this wealth to the power of one minus gamma, which tells us how the value function scales with uh, wealth. Uh, and uh, it's wealth to the power of one minus gamma because if wealth doubles, then it means that uh, portfolio weights stay the same consumption rate per unit of wealth stays the same, but consumption doubles because wealth doubles. And then utility changes by two to the power one minus gamma, and this is reflected by this term. And this part is just a constant. And why I have minus gamma here? Well, um, it's, it's, it's just a normalization that will be convenient and how it's going to be convenient will be clear in a moment. So if we have, um, a value function of this form, how is the value function tied to the consumption? And uh, here, the principle of opt optimization is that the marginal utility of consumption has to equal the marginal value of wealth. So the marginal utility of consumption is C minus gamma, and the marginal value of wealth, differentiating this expression with respect to nt, is going to be omega minus gamma n to the power of minus gamma. And then from this expression, I can write something like this. This is equivalent. Uh, and uh, here we have that consumption equals coefficient omega times wealth n. So consumption is uh, proportional to wealth. And that's why I wrote this constant like this, so that uh, omega t is the proportionality coefficient that tells us how much of the wealth an individual will consume. And uh, an interesting fact about uh, CRRA utility is that if we can observe empirically the wealth of an individual, and if we can empirically observe the consumption of the individual, then we can infer the entire value function. And how? Well, here we have a relationship between C and omega and N. So if we have a value function like this, we could use this relationship to get rid of omega and replace it instead with C and N. And if we do that, then we get an expression like this for the value function. And we see indeed that the value function can be expressed in terms of the wealth of the individual and the observed consumption of the individual. So we can write value functions uh, in this form. And uh, for our specific problem, it will actually be useful, instead of writing value functions like this, to introduce processes V and V underlined to write value functions like this. This is the value function of a representative expert with uh, wealth capital N, the wealth of all experts, and consumption capital C, this is the consumption of all experts. Uh, but instead of working with value functions of this form, in fact, it will be easier for us to work with value functions of uh, this form and instead introduce a uh, process V, and V 
will be a function of eta and this is just a, a scaling appropriate scaling coefficient for the total amount of capital in the economy to disentangle the effect of the total amount of capital from the effect of uh, eta so this is going to be the value function of experts the value function of households is going to be represented by the same expression but with v underlined instead of v okay so in our model the value functions of experts and households can be written in this form in which k to the power of one minus gamma summarizes the dependence of the value functions on the total amount of capital k and this coefficient v will be a function of eta summarizes the dependence of the value functions on uh, the wealth share of uh, experts now imagine that these functions v of eta and v underlined of eta are given so how to determine those value functions that's an important question but we'll worry about that later so if these functions are given and we know that the value function of experts can be written in this form or equivalently can be written in this form from the wealth of experts and their consumption then from the value functions we can derive several objects which are of uh, importance for us specifically the price of risk the ratio of our consumption to wealth and the ratio of consumption to capital because we're going to need those ratios to solve our model so uh, from this equation we know that the wealth of experts is equal to fraction eta of total world wealth and therefore plugging this in we can express the marginal utility of consumption of a representative expert in terms of uh, other objects and we can use this equation then to derive the volatility of uh, the marginal utility of consumption from the right hand side it equals the volatility of v minus the volatility of eta minus the volatility of q which are in the denominator here and minus the volatility of k is given by sigma we have minus gamma and this power of minus gamma times sigma this is the volatility of the stochastic discount factor we also have uh, from this equation we can express the ratio of c to k in this particular way um, and then dividing the left hand side and the right hand side by eta times q we get the ratio c divided by n which is expressed as follows so now we have uh, the price of risk we have uh, consumption to capital ratio and we can use them to solve our model for the allocation as a function of eta and for the price of capital as a function of eta for CRRA utility just in the same way how we did for logarithmic utility so for CRRA utility likewise we have um, the market clearing condition for consumption on the left hand side this is the supply of consumption on the right hand side this is the demand for consumption in which we plugged in this expression for consumption of experts per unit of capital in the economy and then we have an analogous expression for the consumption of households per unit of capital in the economy the second equation here is uh, the first order condition for psi in the region when psi is less than one and we can plug in an expression for the uh, volatility of marginal utility of experts and likewise for households we are going to have some cancellations here and we are going to end up with an expression like this where we also use eta's formula uh, the last equation here is um, 
the uh, equation for endogenous risk and uh, these three equations allow us to get a first order differential equation for eta and q so given the, sorry the first order differential equation for q so given eta and given q we can use this expression we also remember that we know v and v underlined to get psi as a function of eta we can use the second expression given psi and given q and we also know v and therefore v prime and v underlined to get sigma q because we know that sigma eta can also be expressed through sigma q so we can get here sigma q and given sigma q we can use the last equation to get q prime so q prime here is behind my image it's right there um, and uh, this allows us to solve for the allocation uh, also we are interested in um, the uh, drift of eta okay and uh, the drift of eta here we have an expression for the drift of eta and in this expression we have the ratio c divided by n uh, and uh, we have a uh, uh, here the uh, volatility of uh, stochastic discount factor uh, in a special numerator so we have to take that into account but this allows us to get the drift of eta so if we have uh, uh, value functions that are given then those value functions allow us to derive the price of risk the ratio of consumption to wealth and the ratio of consumption to capital and solve for the allocation and solve for the drift and volatility of eta at a given moment of time for zero ray utility so the only question that remains is how to actually determine those value functions so they will be determined through backward equations okay so if we have value functions then we know that we can solve static equations and forward equations to determine the allocation of capital to determine the price of capital as a function of eta and also to determine the drift and volatility of eta now how do we get the value function so if we can determine from the value functions the these objects then it turns out that we can use backward equations to determine the value functions a moment earlier so uh, the value functions they have to satisfy certain value function backward partial differential equation and this partial differential equation uses Ito's formula to evaluate the expected rate of change of the value function uh, in order to evaluate this expected rate of change we can plug in the drift of eta use Ito's formula for v we can plug in uh, the investment rate to determine the uh, drift of k so we can determine this rate of change we have uh, the flow of utility and uh, those two the flow of utility and the expected uh, rate of change of the value function has to equal to the discount rate uh, this is the equation for experts times the experts uh, value function so um, the value functions they have to satisfy this uh, differential equation uh, and uh, the uh, parameters of this equation they uh, they can be solved uh, from this system so we can always solve for value functions uh, by solving the system and taking one small step back in time
So therefore, how do we get full value functions? Numerically, is well, very, very simple. We have to use an iterative procedure in which we start with some guess at value functions at time t. So imagine that at certain uh, final time horizon capital T, very, very far in the future, the value functions are given. Uh, then we can solve uh, what happens to the economy back uh, from that time horizon by taking small steps and at each step solving the static equations for the allocation and uh, solving the equations for the law of motion of eta and then using them in the backward equations for the value function and then we go back until convergence and then we arrive at a stable solution in which the value functions are invariant with time and this is uh, the procedure for how we can uh, get the value functions by uh, having a guess at a very very distant time horizon and solving the system backwards until it uh, uh, stabilizes. Okay, so we are pretty much done. Let me finish by uh, showing you some computed solutions. And after that, for a bonus, I'm going to talk a little bit about money and the money valuation equation, because money valuation equation, it's a backward equation for not the value functions, but for the value of money. And so it's also useful to talk about it to complement everything else that we have talked about. But first, computed solutions. So here is a computed solution with a theory utility with a coefficient of risk aversion two. And uh, this computed solution is for three different uh, coefficients, sigma for the level of exogenous risk, 10%, 5%, and 1%. So one may guess that as exogenous risk decreases, the equilibrium becomes more stable. But there's actually something interesting going on. And if you look on the bottom uh, left panel, which shows the level of uh, endogenous risk sigma q, what we see is that the size of the region in which um, uh, households hold some capital, the crisis region, shrinks as uh, sigma declines. But once the economy enters this region, endogenous risk actually becomes bigger when uh, exogenous shocks are smaller. And this is something that Marcus and I call volatility paradox, that uh, smaller uh, exogenous shocks sometimes lead to larger uh, endogenous risk. This slide shows another example of uh, the volatility paradox, which is perhaps even more dramatic. So here, instead of changing sigma, we relax the equity issuance constraint. So experts are able to pass on more risk to households as uh, CARI declines by issuing equity. And uh, decreasing CARI moves the economy more and more uh, into the uh, frictionless economy, but the frictions don't quite completely disappear. And something that we see here is that when frictions decline, then the size of the crisis region declines, but uh, uh, the point where the drift of eta is zero actually moves closer and closer, uh, moves down and actually remains close to the crisis region. And in the crisis region, the endogenous risk actually rises quite significantly as uh, the parameter chi underlined as it declines. Uh, this is the last example that I'm going to show. Uh, and this example shows the effect of parameter A underlined, which is an interesting parameter. 
So A underline tells us how efficient or inefficient households are at managing capital when they hold it. And A underlined can be negative because, uh, so you may be surprised why it can be negative. Do households get negative output? And the answer is that, well, even if A underlined is negative, households can still get output from capital by disinvesting, by choosing negative IOTA. So negative A underlined is okay. Uh, and the key here is the difference between uh, A and A underlined. And this can be thought of as the liquidity of capital. So if experts, they have to sell capital to the second best group of buyers, how big the discount is going to be, how much less efficient are households compared to experts at uh, managing capital. And when A underlined is lower, then of course capital is going to decline more when experts sell capital to households and that means that endogenous risk will be larger and we see that here endogenous risk can in fact be quite significant. Now moving towards the I theory of money, let me expand some features of this model a little bit and uh, some other features I can be, I'm going to be purposefully vague about them because I'm going to derive a money valuation equation, which is quite general and it's independent of some of the details of the model. So what I'm going to add is to the production technology where we had um, uh, aggregate shocks, I'm also going to add idiosyncratic shocks. And these idiosyncratic shocks are specific to individuals who hold capital and they can be potentially uh, time varying. So uh, there can be several groups of agents. There could be one or there could be two experts in households. There could be intermediaries. There could be more. Uh, and uh, here I'm going to assume that everybody has logarithmic utility. Each group has a different discount rate. Um, this is for simplicity. Uh, and I'm going to assume like in the Bewley economy example that we had at the very beginning of this lecture, that there's also another asset called money, uh, not like the risk-free asset in zero net supply, but money can be uh, potentially some uh, uh, in positive supply some uh, amount of coins and uh, the value of all money is determined endogenously the world portfolio weight the uh, money as a fraction of total wealth is given by theta so theta is the world portfolio weight on money now uh, let me talk about the return on money and I'm going to give uh, two equations and I'm going to express the return on money in terms of the numerator of world wealth because we've used this numerator earlier in uh, the lecture and it's convenient to use this numerator. I'm going to give you the return on money in two scenarios. In one scenario in which the number of coins is fixed and second scenario, more general, in which the number of coins could be changing uh, because of, for example, monetary policy. So if the number of coins is fixed, then the return on money in the numera of world wealth is just going to be the law of motion of theta, the value of all money, the value of all coins, as a fraction of total wealth. So that's going to be the return on money in this case. And then the more general case with policy, the number of coins outstanding M could be changing because of monetary policy. And if you hold uh, one coin, and if the value of all M coins is given by theta, then if you hold one coin, the value of uh, your coin is, as a as a, uh, in this numerator is given by theta divided by m. So the return on your coin 
this is assuming that uh, you don't get any interest rate from holding the coin, you're just holding the coin. The return on theta divided by m can be found just by finding the law of motion of theta divided by m and using Ito's formula. This is given by the drift of theta minus the drift of m, the volatility of theta minus the volatility of m, and there's an extra term for the drift, which is uh, given by uh, this expression right here. Uh, and uh, I can introduce special notation for the return and money under policy, uh, mu h bar plus sigma h bar. So this slide discusses the return on money uh, in case when the number of coins is fixed and in case when the number of coins could potentially be changing due to monetary policy. Okay, so here people are exposed to this idiosyncratic risk from capital that they hold. And because of this exposure to idiosyncratic risk, there can be demand for coins which are potentially intrinsically worthless but people may want to still hold coins because coins do not have idiosyncratic risk. And uh, if uh, capital is hit by a negative idiosyncratic shock, people can uh, use coins that they have saved to buy more capital and to maintain their um, production. So how can we value those coins? So the value of coins, of course, will depend on policy. But how can we value those coins? So let me use this uh, asset pricing principle that uh, the uh, difference between expected returns of two assets can be explained for logarithmic utility by the uh, covariance between the difference in uh, uh, risk and uh, the risk of wealth because the risk of wealth captures the price of risk for an agent with logarithmic utility. If I use this principle for uh, our model, then of course there are two sources of risk. There is aggregate source of risk and there is idiosyncratic. And I'm going to use this principle to price the whole portfolio that um, agents in group I hold relative to uh, holding just money. Uh, on the left hand side, this is the difference in expected returns in the numerator of world wealth uh, between the whole portfolio and um, money. And money has some return, which I have uh, uh, discussed on a previous slide. And then the whole portfolio has return that consists of a, a capital gains portion and a dividend yield portion. This is the difference in risk between the whole portfolio and money, the aggregate risk. And this is the price of aggregate risk. Uh, and this is uh, idiosyncratic risk exposure of group I squared. So idiosyncratic risk exposure is both the uh, idiosyncratic risk of the whole portfolio as well as the price of idiosyncratic risk. So for each group I, I have uh, an equation like this, uh, where uh, this is the um, drift and volatility of the wealth share of this group uh, given by this equation. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to write this equation for every single group, and I'm going to um, add these equations up with weights uh, of, uh, given by wealth shares and then something beautiful is going to happen. So if I do that, then uh, the uh, weighted average sum of the drifts of wealth shares adds up to zero because the total uh, wealth shares add up to uh, the, the whole wealth in the economy, one which is not changing. This is just the weighted average discount rate this one, the weights add up to one, so this is going, just going to be the expected return on money. This part is, uh, there will be two parts, 
One of them is the weighted average of uh, aggregate risk exposure of individual groups squared. And here I have uh, that the risks, weighted average of risks, they add up to zero because um, uh, the wealth shares, they, they add up to zero. So this one, this term goes away. And here we have a weighted average uh, idiosyncratic risk exposure. And voila, from here we get the second line, which can be thought of as um, a forward equation for the um, for theta, which is the um, world portfolio weight on money. Uh, and uh, in the special case when there is only one group of agent let's uh, apply this equation then the right hand side is just going to be the idiosyncratic risk exposure of everybody which is given by the idiosyncratic risk of capital times the portfolio weight in capital squared and the left hand side is going to be um, the discount rate of this group of agents and uh, some uh, uh, monetary policy uh, parameters because here theta is constant and stationary. And what we see from this equation is that theta is uh, given in closed form by other parameters of the model. And in particular, when idiosyncratic risk rises, theta is uh, going to rise, so demand on, uh, for money is going to rise. Okay, so this is it. This is the end of the online lecture. We have talked about uh, many uh, useful steps in the process of uh, solving this uh, main model. I have taken several detours. And at Princeton Initiative, we are going to uh, use uh, some uh, similar principles to do some interesting exercises. But in general, it's uh, fascinating how the past and how the future, they meet in the present moment to determine today's outcome. Uh, in our specific model, the past determines accumulated capital and determines the wealth of uh, uh, different individuals in our economy and the future determines the value functions and determines the price of risk and determines the demand for uh, consumption versus savings. It's uh, fascinating how uh, the future and the past interact and uh, in many research uh, questions this interaction leads to some very interesting uh, conclusions. Uh, I have taken several detours here because it's important to keep in mind uh, the big picture. Uh, and uh, whenever you have a, a question in mind, you want to keep in mind the big picture and you will also want to understand what uh, you can simplify and what you cannot simplify. simplify things when it's necessary to simplify things in order to get to a nice and uh, crisp and beautiful and elegant conclusion. Thank you.